Welcome, everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about the CPI data and why we don't need to worry about out-of-control inflation or out-of-control mortgage rates. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. Sarah, thank you for doing the Lord's work. <laughs> you know, uh, I think I think the the terminology of the Tasmanian you know housing economist is great. I prefer Wolverine for obvious reasons, but you know, to put up with me, I think I, I'm glad that we're, I'm seeing the appreciation of everyone. And now, now that you're doing the Lord's work, and we talked about this, I think a year ago, where that gentleman told me, he's like, I know who you are. You're the whirlwind. And I was asking you about the biblical references to that. But uh, again, you put up with so much. No, it's my pleasure. It's so great. I love that one of our uh, podcast fans was like, you know, uh, gave you that moniker and and said I was doing the Lord's work. So let's jump in. So you wrote a great article for us about the CPI data. So, you know, it, that, and you and I went through that article, it is hard to interpret that. Um, there are a lot of different ways we could go. So, so bring us to what is your interpretation of the CPI data? Well, first of all, like we have such big crybabies on t- Twitter finance. It's like, you know, one person, oh my God, the Fed has a hike rates. Oh my God, inflation's still a problem. Oh, you know, this is going to, you know, uh, go down over the next few months because the rent I- I- index isn't really that bad. So I thought I, start off with the article and say, you know, headline inflation, 12 months is running at 3.2%. And if you look at the average going back to 1914, that's running at 3.3%. So context is critical. You know, I think everyone's getting itchy fingers because people want to see the Fed cut rates, but we don't sometimes don't realize, you know, the progress that has been made. Uh, We were running eight, 9% CPI inflation not that long ago. So uh, we made great progress. And I think, I mean, just for me, the OER rent uh, factor variable went back down to trend. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, I think over time, that starts to normalize itself. A lot of people think about January and February inflation data as the repricing of the year. So you could get head faked a lot. Uh, And then as the year goes on, you know, some of the disinflation factors that have been here in the economy start to take hold. And uh, I, I I just think we, we have such a struggle out there between people who want to see a recession, who want to see higher rates, between those who want to see rate cuts and not have a recession, that sometimes if you if you fall into that noise category, you don't know what to make of it. But uh, let's just push this forward and see how the next six months go, especially with the disinflation factors of rent. It is literally mathematically impossible to have the 1970s without rents taken off and the variable factors that are in place right now with more supply, wage growth. You don't usually have rents take off like we saw during the global pandemic, which the history of global pandemics, shelter inflation always takes off and then disinflation. So the article was to try to explain to people, you know, the 10 to 18 percent mortgage rates we saw in the late 70s and early 80s, not likely going to be the case without some extreme variables kicking in. Thank goodness, because they're already high enough uh, as far as our industry goes. I think one of the things about that report was, you know, if you want to look at the month to month and and the growth um, since January versus the yearly data. So when you're looking at it, do you pay much attention to how the month is going? Or are you more looking at the 12 month? Well, I think this is one of the things where Chairman Powell talked about, you know, we can't really, you know, unless we have like some really recessionary uh, deflation factors kicking in, the month-to-month data is going to stabilize out. I mean, just just the, you know, month-to-month uh, uh, PCE data was running, you know, three to six months running with one handle. So the 0. 0.4 uh, increase was, was running kind of where estimates were. Uh, um, but I would say that let's just look at the progress that's been made and look out in the future because it looks like to me that that inflation burst is over. And I think I, I'm saying this with all honesty, the people that are telling you we have to hike rates, we have to keep rates high, want a recession, right? There's no point in this anymore. This, that whole, the inflation story ended a while ago. Uh, and you, you always look at it in this light, uh, if you wanted to change the view. If people say inflation is so bad and the economy is terrible, they can't say the economy is strong and we have to keep uh, rates up. You know, you can't be, oh, we're all, we're in a recession already. And then you ask the people, well, should we cut rates then? No, the economy is too strong. You're going to have to pick a side and go with it. And I think you can really see the difference between uh, how, how I look at it is 
um, stock traders talking about a recession or people with political agendas talking about recession. And then the groups, you know, there, there is no recession, you know, uh, but we have to keep rates high. There's a lot of different talking points now because we're at that stage where the Fed has said we're cutting rates three times. Uh, and if you look at the rate cuts in the context that the growth rate of inflation has fallen a lot from, you know, the peak. Uh, and remember, the Fed doesn't look at CPI, it looks at PCE. We got two handles on PCE inflation, right? Uh, uh, even if it comes in a little bit, the, the, by the time this podcast is out, the PPI report will come out and that filters into uh, the PCE data. We're kind of there in that sense. As long as this keeps on moving along forward and we don't create a lesson, we don't have the negative disinflation factors. And I think that's just, we're we're just at that stage where, uh, you get you get you get a lot of people who are just they 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 don't want to see rate cuts or they don't want to see the ten year yield go low and like I've I've expressed here all the time, I think if you're a bearish Russian Chinese and American citizen, you do not want the ten year yield trading between three point three seven and three point eight zero. You that is that is soft landing written all over it, especially if the mortgage spreads get better. I mean, you are sweating at night, you're in panic every single day. You do not want that to happen. So. You get a lot of frantic takes right off away, and the bond market's up a little bit, you know, from from the recent low. I think we're about eleven basis points off the recent lows out here. So it's just, it is what it is. Everything kind of looks normal to me, um, but the the one variable that didn't, the OER that came back down. And remember, single family rents are holding up better than apartments. The disinflation that we see in the uh, uh, housing industry is apartments out there. And there's a lot of production still coming online and wage growth is cooling down. You mathematically cannot have inflation or shelter inflation take off in a big way if you have wage growth slowing down and also supply coming up, right? So this is the whole point was like, if you're going to do a 1970s models or the, the three wave inflation that people like to use all the time, you're going to need a supply shock somewhere because the economy is technically outperforming, right? We're growing above trend. The stock market rebounded, right? Bitcoin is up again. People are selling dumb things. All you know, we're 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 doing those stupid things again, which means inflation is not taking off like it did. So the supply part of the uh, equation is is getting back to normal. If you want that second and third wave to be much higher than the first one. You're going to need a supply shock somewhere. And I, in, in that article, we talked about things that could happen that could possibly create that supply shock. Well, and, and it wasn't just one thing that would happen. It would have to be sort of a cascade of things, including, you know, like China and Russia. You know, China would have to invade Taiwan and Russia would have to continue to do their thing. And then there'd have to be, you know, this thing in Israel. So you really go into it in the article because, as you said, it would have to be the Godzilla of all supply shocks to really make this just just look at just let's all remember what happened when when Russia invaded Ukraine. It wasn't just oil prices that spiked. Uh, wheat prices took off. And that's really important. That's why I, I always like to do I show wheat charts and people. Why do you keep on showing wheat charts? Look at that wheat and oil. Everyone, if you really want to nerd out, go look at wheat and oil prices. Russian invasion. Boom. And then came back down. So the disinflation factors of that event. But imagine if there was a grand world war. Where Russia really started to, you know, hold the line uh, in, on production and wheat prices took off and China invaded Taiwan and nobody could get chips from anywhere and the Iranians send their pirates out in the Red Sea. and attack. You know, if you have something like that and headline inflation goes up and then you companies have to compensate people for the cost of living going up, then wages have to go up again. Something like that, you could actually you know, kind of move in the direction. But what we've seen here is basically what we were told by the same people who are crying right now. The same people are saying last year, you can't have inflation cool down unless the unemployment rate is at this percentage for this long or anything like that. Come on, guys, it's literally we're one, we're one basis point below the, the more than 100 year average of inflation. Right. And, and this is not accounting for the disinflation factors that are going to come from housing. And I think that's the thing going out the next few people want the march to kind of August data to kind of get a get a perspective. But the the year over year data has room to go down. The the month, the month, the three to six month can be stable right here. And the Fed's kind of talked about that. They're not looking for like really great progress on that because then that goes into the disinflation below two percent. And you know, people would say you a recession could get that to that level. And we actually saw 
uh, deflation for a very few months after the great financial recession uh, uh, out there. And, you know, of course, when COVID happened, oil prices went, the futures market went negative. So there's stuff like that has to occur now if you're talking about the second or third wave, like we saw in the 70s. And just remember, the 70s, housing was booming back then. Labor force growth was booming. Uh, uh, oil shock, adjusting to inflation is a hot, like $450 compared to current dollars right now. So we don't have those things here. No, they're not here. So uh, uh, context with the inflation discussion, but you can see, like we always talk about itchy fingers with the bond market. You can see the, the panic, right? The people that put so much of their career out the line and saying 2022 recession years, 2023 recession year. And they're like, you know, and you can keep on saying the lag and lag and you'll be one of these people that uh, the recession is here literally any day of your life. You could say that. So let's uh, be a little bit more mindful of the data and, and track it religiously like we always do and put some context into the inflation data and try to get off the 70s argument uh, unless you really want to put the supply shock premise in there. Although I appreciated you writing, uh, you know, I love that headline because I was able to go and get a, a picture of the night. I think I think you end that article with like, you know, put your disco, give your disco pants to Goodwill. So I went out and found a found a picture for that article of uh, 70s disco pants. So it was fun, it, you know, in that in that regard, fun. Yeah. Give your disco pants to the Salvation <laughs> Army. Though I do, my, my little uh, copper jacket reminds a lot of people of the 70s, so. It does. No, it absolutely does. There's a couch in our headquarters uh, in in Dallas that uh, matches that exactly. We always it always reminds us of it. Clayton, so I was like, don't wait. If we put Logan on that couch, would we be able to see him? Um, let's talk about purchase apps. Yes, and and purchase apps again. Positive week to week, back to back weeks of positive. What happened? Rates fell. Right. So. There's it's a carbon copy somewhat to a degree of what happened last year when rates started to go up, purchase apps fell. When rates started to go down, purchase apps picked up. We're, we're just working from the lowest levels ever. And that's the thing. We're not getting any real traction. We're not crashing and we're not rising. We're just stuck, right? And this is why I like to do those weekly data updates. So from the point where mortgage rates fell from 8% all the way down to near 6.5%, We've had 10 positive purchase application data prints. We've had five negative purchase application data prints. This is the weeklies. I don't, I don't count the holiday period. Then if we do the year to dates, we have four positive and five negative. But that five negative happened five straight weeks, which didn't occur last year. So home sales, they're not going anywhere, right? There was this kind of back and forth. And again, historically after 1996, it's just really rare to trend below 4 million. We've had a few months under 4 million. Uh, but even after the great financial recession, the house 2008, where we got down to like 3.77, that kind of stopped and sales started to pick up again here, third calendar year of great recession lows, uh, uh, in demand and something by the time this podcast comes out, I'm, I'm probably done my CNBC, uh, uh interview or it's coming up. And that, that's one of the things I'm going to highlight advantage builder still, because the builders can say, Hey guys, I've got a brand new house. If Sarah Wheeler is going to buy with a very good mortgage rate, all of you should too, because, you know, so um, the builder still, you know, as long as that 10 year yield is below four and a quarter, it, 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 they, they have the financial capacity to do that. Uh, and they have that still big backlog that they have to work through. So they are motivated to make deals where the existing home sales market monthly supply is still not that high. Sellers don't really feel too stressed. Uh, but again, the active inventory is growing. It's not a lot. I know I always like to show the data year over year and people go, that's not a lot. I know it's not a lot. The new listings data is growing year over year, but it's basically trending at where we saw 2021 and spring 2022 uh, before rates went up to above 6%. So, but anything is positive, right? That's how you should look at it. We We want to stay as far away from March 2022 inventory data because that was the worst housing market I've ever seen post 2010, where more than 75% of the homes were getting multiple bids. Not a good thing, not a positive. So all this to me, it's very, this is what, this is what I wanted to happen last year, you know, with the inventory data, but because mortgage rates had gone down to near 6%, the forward looking purchase application data had 12 weeks. I always say 12 to 14 weeks. If you get 12 to 14 weeks, you got something material there here. We only had eight weeks of positive straight demand. So it's a much different kind of marketplace. As you can see, it's, it's allowing inventory to grow, right? It's nothing spectacular. It's not this 2008 store or anything like that, but uh, a positive in that light, that's that's how I'm looking so far 
uh, for the housing market in 2024. So Mike Simonson, of course, he's the president of Altos Research, which you love looking at. Um, so he, his no, video I love this looking week at his charts. <laughs> you love looking at the data, the charts, yes. So um, his video this week, his headline was that uh, we could see inventory 40% up over last year. But yes. like you said, it's like, oh, that sounds really good. Unless you look at last year and go, what does it actually mean? It was funny because when Mike used that headline, one of these trolling coward least, by the way, just, just a note, you guys on X hiding behind those stupid, stupid, lame nades. Oh my God. They're like, ah, 40% increase. I'm like, homie, do you realize we're up over a hundred percent since the lows of 2022? They're like, no, that's not true. Yes, it is. I right? said, so we're going to do a math. Get, get your calculator out. Get your, I know you can't do this in your head. Get your calculator out. We had 240,000 active listings in March of 2022. We're a little bit above 500. Do the math there. Take your calculator and do the math. That's a double. Context is key, right? Uh, I'm not a big fan of using percentages up or down when you have very, very low levels because it can make it seem like something crazy has happened. That's why I like to take the aggregate data all together. Uh, uh, and it's shocking to think that inventory is up 100% from the lows and home prices aren't crashing, but you have to put the supply and demand equilibrium. If there's one lesson I want to teach the men of America, the supply and demand equilibrium matters, right? And don't you don't have to panic or like like walking on eggshells every single time. If inventory grows up, doesn't mean home prices are crashing. I think if we can make American men tougher, they can you know learn to enjoy life a little bit more. But in this regards, the supply and demand equilibrium is home sales aren't crashing like they were in 2022. This is why I always say like 2022, the second half of 2022 was the cr craziest period ever because we had literally the fastest crash in sales ever. A and because mortgage rates went from three to six, six to five, five to seven, it was, uh, that was, that was the most dysfunctional housing market ever. But in the second half, you actually had authentic home price declines on a month to month basis, not just the seasonality of prices falling. By the way, we, we still have some crazy people that don't understand that their seasonality and prices. Um, and then it happened with inventory very low and monthly supply low. Well, the product that was available in the system, in the system marketed maybe three to four, 5% mortgages, seven and a half. They needed to cut prices to get, uh, uh, uh those sales done. There's your price declines here. It's, it's a lot different. Home sales aren't crashing anymore. They're just kind of hanging around here in the 4 million. That's why I talk about the supply and demand equally. You have to work with that. This also means you have to track data religiously every single week, which I don't think people have the patience for. Uh, uh, and then you could kind of read in between lines. This is where I think the tracker gets a little bit more uh, useful. You know, when, when, when rates are low and demand is up, you know, um, prices are right here. It's just that, you know, internal, what we all call the mud fight, two men stuck in mud and just trying to, fight each other. It's, it's, it's very methodical, but you have to find inflection points or what the data is saying. And what we saw is when rates got, you know, uh, uh, down the last few weeks, purchase apps rose, purchase app looks out 30 to 90 days. It's not going to be an immediate thing. Uh, but we try to keep that MBA purchase application data live for everyone to see. And boy, when home sales were crashing, remember 2022 fastest home sale crash ever in history, six and a half million down to 4 million. It took 2005 to 2008 to do that. Back then, that was the housing credit boom and bust. That's how crazy 2022 was. It's the craziest housing year ever. It also was the greatest head fake up to the US recession ever in history. Man, I'm just going to write a book about 2022. That was, that was just nuts. Um, but in this regards, you can actually see what's going on. Inventory is slowly increasing. There's more choices out there positive. It's not historically big, but the affordability issue can affect pricing, especially in some areas uh, of the country. Like, you know, we, we, we talk about Florida, uh, where in Florida, uh, all those areas that were hit with hurricanes, you know, there those homes are kind of being built back up. Do you really want to buy a house in that area? If the insurance, you can't get insurance or you get insurance, it's very high and you're prone to uh, basically a, a hurricane wiping you out. So that's the climate change risk uh, uh, that, you know, even for myself, you know, I, I, my second property is in a climate risk area. If my tenant decide 
to ever leave. I'm not keeping that just because there's like been five fires uh, that's almost engulfed it. And so it's, it's one of these things we have to start thinking about in the future. Every single year, you find these climate zone hotspots and, and how do people react to that? Uh, uh, because it's, it's a financial thing. You know, it's one thing if mortgage rates were at three, four percent or something, but with mortgage rates at seven percent and insurance costs high and the risk of the home being wiped out next year, is it, is it something you really want to, you know, start your family in? No, it's a great point. It's something we're really watching because it is this not new variable, but definitely an, uh, I think that variable has really heated up when you think about the fact that there are areas of the country where um, you you don't really have an insurance uh, of last resort. You have a lot of companies pulling out and the, the people who are there, the people, the insurance of last resort has jacked their rates up. Um, and so, you know, you bought the house thinking you had a cost of ownership at one rate. Um, and now, you know, it could be much different. So I, I do think that that is a, a big variable. Yes. You know, I just got my uh, insurance uh, renewed in that area in the fire zone and it was like 450 bucks. So I did the math. That's like six DoorDash, you know, meals for me. So, um, yeah, people may not know that you're, you're addicted to DoorDash and that we I, I order you about DoorDash 24 seven. I, I literally don't, I, I, I'm not joking when I say this. I, and I ordered DoorDash twice in the weekend. I literally do not, I can't even, I don't even cook like microwave things in it. It's literally DoorDash 24 seven. And we were laughing because, because nobody in housing wire can believe me. And then I go, look at how much money I saved doing the DoorDash pass. It was like $9,000 of fees I saved, which means I must be spending a lot. Everyone right now, all of our listeners are like, what? What is he talking about? It is crazy. I've seen it. Yes, we we tease him mercilessly about it on here. Apparently, he does not cook at all. So there you go. But that's good. I mean, you know, you're, you're living your best life, Logan. That's what we would say. Yes. Charts and DoorDash. <laughs> Charts and DoorDash. Okay, well, uh, let's talk a little bit. So I had um, Odetta Cushy on yesterday. So much fun to have her on the podcast. And you... Odetta and Mike and I are all going to be on stage together at the gathering. I, it's going to be me and, you know, some big brains in the room, right? You would probably say nerds, but yes, I'm not I, I think you. Odetta is a mortgage rate lockdown person. So that's going to be fun. You know, now you got Mike oh, and me. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the girls against the boys, uh, that yeah. would be amazing, but she's, she's great. We talked about. I, yeah. I think it'll be interesting because my, Mike's Mike and I don't believe in a mortgage rate lockdown for two different reasons. Right. So I think that'll that discussion will be good. Just like, you know, when you, you took me out of the mortgage rate lockdown debate, which anybody could go see right now. It'll be very it'll be live and open. And and which there are have been people reaching out to me saying you actually won, Sarah. So let's just let's just keep that in mind. You wanted that video up because you're like, it's going to show how how Logan won. You might have won the room, but I've had people reach out that said I won. So. No, it's not adorable. Do not patronize me, sir. No. Okay. What? <laughs> Keep hanging on. Mine. <laughs> okay, so we've covered a lot of things. One of the things I I talked to Oden about was um, home prices because it is surprising. You know, as we get more inventory coming online, then you have the opposite crash people or, or people thinking maybe that'll bring uh, home prices down a little bit. And it, and it might, right? It, it at least, but I think there's enough demand there that that's not going to, it's not going to be a huge hit or anything. Here's the thing. I believe, I'm not exactly sure. I believe I had the lowest price growth forecast out there for 2024, uh, which means real home prices will be negative, adjusting to inflation, the equivalence of rent. Uh, um, so it, I, but I'm not a fed pivot person either. So by the way, the tomatoes that are being thrown at me every day, when I bring up that, look, I told you guys, the fed's not going to pivot, you know, and everybody gets bad, but I said, I'm seriously like, you guys haven't, you guys should just follow me. And the, the, when the fed pivots, trust me, they will tell you we're going to neutral and the bond yields will go down and rates, you know, but they're not, they're not there yet. But it, in this regard, because I, I wasn't a recession person, it's not shocking that the 10 year yield is kind of for the most part in the last uh, few, uh, few months has been between 380 to four and a quarter. So when we do the tracker article, I get to bring out my chart lines and everything. I say, okay, this, this looks about right to me. 
above four point, you know, three, you know, that level, not, not so much. That, that, that would be problematic. So because of that, and I'm not a mortgage rate lockdown person and inventory can grow because new listings data could grow. Because if people remember last year on CNBC, I was like, hey, new listings data is not going down anymore with higher rates. This is telling us something that we can grow this next year uh, uh, and when the seasonality kicks in. But it's growing. We're just back to this is what I this is what I wanted to see back to 2021 and 2022 levels before rates went up. We're, we're there. I was hoping for a little bit more just because we had one year that what, not much was happening. But I'll, I'll take what I could get. If you put that equilibrium together, right? Mortgage rates, inventory rising, you know, price growth uh, uh, can cool down. Last year, of course, it was, you know, when home prices were up 6% and, and existing home sales were trending at the lowest levels ever. So it's shocking. But if you look at the inventory data last year, it was different. We bottomed out in April, new listings data never went anywhere, really. Uh, um, so you're dealing with less supply. Now the supply and demand equilibrium has changed. And this is why I'm, I'm trying to teach people this. This is more important than some crazy headlines out there. And then the data can correlate like this going back many, many years, and then everybody gets to be versed because everybody's looking at the correct data out there. Uh, so that's why uh, my, my forecast was probably a lot lower uh, than than anyone else is now. Uh, is it a lot of supply? No. Is it really two states that are highly populated are pushing it? Yes, but still growth is growth. Uh, and I know there's parts of the country that are having bidding wars again, and there's parts of the country that are still near all-time lows in inventory, savagely unhealthy, by the way. Uh, but in in this case, uh, we try to keep everyone versed with the freshest data because by the time you get the existing home sales report or Case Shiller or FHA, oh, that's way old, man. That's like three or four months old. We want to get the data now and then look forward with the forward-looking indicator so everybody's versed and you don't get shocked by the time the data comes and confirms it. And we're not old and slow. Uh, and shout out to our listener who sent us a message and said, uh, we are savagely trustworthy. I like that. I thought that was great. I will take yes. that. Yes, it is. This is very true. Sense-ridden. Okay. Well, Logan, thank you so much for being on. I will actually be off the next two days. I know I'm actually taking time off. Chris Clow will be our very able host for the next couple of days. Thank you for being on and giving us the all of the insight on inflation. Pleasure, Sarah. And as always, you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> <laughs>